you know, there are a few features that are so, fu so fundamentally human that they represent the core of what paleoanthropology is interested in. And those features such as articulated speech like the one I'm producing now or our dependence on material record, we know it evolved during the Pleistocene, but the exact mechanisms of how we became humans are still, you know, let's call it a mystery. In order to study it, I started from a framework proposed by Dave Potts in 1998 called the variability hypothesis. And at the core of the variability hypothesis, there's this notion that what is important is not the particular environmental conditions, but change. So when you look, for example, you take an example of bears. Bears are really cool, grizzly bears, polar bears. You can imagine having specialists, specialists that are adapted very well to say cold and wet conditions, or specialists that are adapted very well to hot and dry conditions. You can also have generalists that are adapted not that well, but to a wider range of conditions. So, you know, they're not doing as well as the specialists if it's very cold or very hot, but they're kind of okay through a much wider range of conditions. So Richard Porot proposes that there's a different type of organism, which we call versatilist. So a versatilist is somebody who is adapted to change. If we carry on with the, with the bear example, bears shed fur. And when they do that, they actually adapt to a change in conditions rather than to any particular type of them. So if you look at the, uh, at the environmental record of Africa, you see that, uh, that things change. It gets wetter, it gets drier, it gets hotter, it gets colder. And initially, if I get the pointer, Initially, I don't think that's going to work. Let's see. Yeah, so initially, you know, the guys who were called adapted, their pool of genes is the highest. However, as the conditions change, they actually, there's less and less of them. Oh, sorry. And that all goes, you know, the hotter it gets, the more hot adapted specialists, the cooler it gets, the more cool adapted specialists. However, when the, when the environmental uh, change becomes very rapid and much more pronounced, just like here, it is actually the versatilists that take over because they are adapted to change and not to cold or hot environment. And why do we care? We care because a lot of the adaptations I mentioned, the adaptations that we consider human are versatilist adaptations. They are not an adaptation to particular type of savanna or particular type of a forest. They are actually adaptations to what happens when things change. Problem solving, creativity, learning, all these cognitive things that humans develop really well. Our dependence on culture. You know, I don't care if it's cold outside, I just put my coat on, which is much quicker and much better way of doing it than shedding fur. I'm pretty sure about that. And then we have the social environment, the, you know, calling your mom and asking for money because you run out of, during your holidays in that situation. If something changes, we have the social networks to support us in the times of need. So all of this is in understanding where versatilist features could evolve and why they evolve is key to understanding why we behave, why why we are the way we are. All right, so this model has been formalized already before I started, but Matt Grove, <coughs> and he used, sorry. <coughs> and he used a genetic model. In this genetic model, the Versatilis is a generalist with an extra fitness boost, which make him independent from the environmental fluctuations, but the rest stays the same. So you have three types of genes, the cold, the hot, and the Versatilis gene. And the Versatilis gets this extra fitness boost. And in a formal way, it looks like, <coughs> like this. So the set of scary equations, which are really super simple, represents what is the fitness of each individual at every time period 
depending on the temperature and the change. And it can be represented on this graph. So we go with time, starting from zero and going to, say, 70. And, and the, the climate changes as a sine curve. So initially, the hot adapted specialist has the best of time. And the cold adapted specialist is basically screwed. What happens in the middle is environment changes, and obviously the hot adapted specialist gets worse, and cold adapted specialist gets better. The versatile, the generalist is, you know, whatever. The versatilist is a bear that lives in a car. It doesn't care what temperature is outside. Um, and then the versatilist <coughs> is kind of in the middle. So you see those lines, those dotted lines, they're slightly higher than the generalist lines. And that just shows that there is this extra fitness boost that makes you independent from the, envi from the environmental conditions. And the single locus, locus results show that there is an uh, immense period of when versatilist features would be promoted. And that period is quite wide, which is probably good for the author, and goes from 2.5 million years ago to 1.2. So I rewrote this model into an agent-based model. The original one is a frequency equation-based model. I rewrote it into an agent-based one because I can create a <coughs> more heterogeneous population. I can make it more spatially explicit, and I can model things like population growth. So in the original model, you know, everyone just adds up to zero because it's frequentist. I can actually have population growth as one of the parameters. So let's step back and think about the research questions we have about it. So the key one is, <coughs> who is this person? Is it versatilist this person? Uh, is, it, is it one of the specialists? Is it a combination of them? And when and how, you know, the versatilist features, are they related in any way to dispersal? And I say dispersal because that's my favorite topic and that's what I decided to study. So there's no other reason you could run run it against other processes that we know occurred during the Paleolithic. So now for the model, we have six types of agents. They live on a grid, as they usually do, and they do two things in their lives. They, uh, they make babies and they travel, which is probably a good <laughs> life in itself. <laughs> so in order to make babies, they use a roulette wheel algorithm. And I tested some other algorithms, but um, <clears throat> this one was the most uh, uh, the most appropriate. And the way we do it is that each, each of the agents has a slot in the roulette wheel. And that slot, is the size of it, is proportional to how fit this individual is. Then we spin the roulette, and obviously if you have a big slot, you have a better chance of producing a child. But if you have a small slot, you still have a chance, the, but the probability is lower. And I think this is a fair representation of how, you know, people, yeah, had babies and still do. Um, so that's the algorithm we, so we're then we choose two parents and we get uh, a child that gets a combination of their genes. So it's a pretty simple thing. For the migration, we take into account the group size and the individual fitness uh, in relation to the average fitness of the group. So the closest to the carrying capacity ceiling, the higher the chance of each individual migrating. And that is represented, the pink line is a 90%. So that basically means the more people is on our, around you, the more likely you are to go because there is a high level of competition. If there aren't any people around you, then why the hell would you disperse? Because you're perfectly fine where you are. So, so the higher, the, the, the more crowded it is, the more likely people are to migrate. And second, and this is the most controversial part, and I'm very happy to you know, take, your, take your comments on that. The second part is the lower your fitness, and so everything towards, towards me, which is right, towards right, is the lower fitness. The lower your fitness, the more likely you are to migrate. And the reason is, if you are very well adapted, you can outcompete other people. But if you are not well adapted to where you are, your better option is to move. So that is a big assumption that I put in. There is some literature about it, but it's actually pretty difficult to 
quantify fitness of both animals and humans and then say, oh yeah, it's always the worse adapted people that migrate or it's always better adapted people that migrate. So I can spin the model and twist it and have it in the opposite assumption. This is perfectly doable. There's this little K in this equation. If I remove the minus sign, then it, it's going to run the other, the opposite way. Um, but for now, that's how it is. Okay, so they, uh, they reproduce, they migrate, and they also produce results, which is great. So the first thing I did is I compared my results to the original model, to the frequentist you know, equation-based model, because that gives me you know, a good confidence that there are no bugs in the code. And, and to do it, I aligned it, the two models. So, you know, in my model, there are agents, so I had to create a very group, very high level uh, population to match the, you know, to remove some of the stochasticity. stochasticity. Um, I switched off the migration because it wasn't in the original model and I initiated with, uh, with exactly the same conditions. And lo and behold, we replicated the original model. So I'm very happy with that because that means it actually works and we can be very confident that the results are, the, are actual patterns and not just something I introduced as I was coding it. Um, this is a good moment to explain this graph because you will see a little bit more of it. So in the original model, on the, the original model is in black, the replication. So what I do is in the kind of little colorful color, color, color elements, you have the magnitude of temperature fluctuations. So how, how much the temperature, the environment changes and towards left, uh, you have very highly fluctuating cl climate regimes and towards the right, the right, you have a very stable climate regimes. And so what we then uh, calculate is how long does it take for the versatilist features to take hold and kind of overpower the population. Um, and obviously the more stable regimes, the longer it takes them. Uh, and in the, the four values, the zero, and then 0 0.01, 0 0.001, etc. Those are the values of the fitness boost that we give to the versatilis. So you can see those are, this is a pretty small fitness boost, um, but it still makes, uh, have an effect. All right, so now my results. First of all, I switched the population growth on because I thought population growth is key for understanding, you know, the dynamics. And uh, it made no difference to the results, which uh, was uh, disappointing because I'm a big population growth fan. Uh, it turns out that actually adding population growth changes very little. And that's probably because once the population reaches the current capacity, which happens pretty quickly in the simulation, well, that's it. They're, they're staying there. So actually, there is very little in terms of that fluctuation going on, which means that it doesn't change much. However, if you add migration to the equation, you can see that all of my color, color dots, squares and triangles they are much lower. And that just means that it takes less time for the versatilist to take hold of the population and overpower it. So the population turns into more and more versatilist population much quicker if, if they can migrate. And this is absolutely key for uh, sorry, for our understanding, because until now we thought, well, you have to be pretty versatile to disperse. But nobody ever mentioned, nobody ever thought that dispersal in itself as a process will promote those, you know, behavioral and adapta adaptive changes that we're all so interested in, uh, in learning about. So, it's, uh, as you per usual, it's more complex than I expected. Uh, I did ask the question, who is dispersing? And that's another interesting thing. You know, we thought, oh, it's gonna be the versatilist dispersing. Oh, it's gonna be, maybe it's a specialist that is in a particularly bar, bad place at the moment that is dispersing. But actually, it's usually a very mixed population. And the reason for that is that, imagine the ants are the hot specialists and they're doing great. So that's why there's so many of them. And the little green bags are the versatilists and they're not doing that great at all. 
So that if only 10% of the dominant type of organism in the population migrates, it's still a lot of individuals, even though the probability <clears throat> for them is much lower than for those that are not doing that great, that are more likely to disperse, but because they're not doing that great, there's also less of them. So the prediction of that is that we cannot really differentiate between, you know, versatilist will be, will be at the forefront of the dispersal or not, because what will be at the forefront of dispersal is whoever has the highest proportion of the original population, regardless of, you know, what proportion of them will be going, which again is quite interesting because we never thought about it. It makes everything more complicated and it makes it more difficult to compare to archaeological record, but, you know, it's good to know. And, uh, and does the dispersal change the dynamics? Um, it does, because it gives less fit individuals a way out, uh, which means that the total diversity of the population increases. So because the less fit individuals can migrate rather than stay and just be, you know, led to extinction, uh, it means that we have more diversity in the population and that promotes um, that promotes the uh, versatilist genes. This is fairly preliminary, I mean, less preliminary now because I actually run it not millions of times, but quite a few times. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is actually pretty solid. And in the next step, you know, I will look at, uh, at spatially embedding the model. So it li they, they live on one grid cell now and they kind of fall into a chasm of migration. They, they disperse to, to the, you know, ever hunting place. So, um, but now I'm working on creating um, a one dimensional space where they have to cross a barrier or go through a gradient of hot and cold conditions or a combination of those. So we will learn more um, about Versatilis and their dispersals very, very soon, I hope. Thank you.